Let's begin our worship this afternoon singing our gathering praise from the Psalter, Psalter 190, which is based on Psalm 113. Psalter 190. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to our worship as we conclude our Lord's Day, worshiping together again in God's house with God's people, but we worship the one true living God. We worship the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We come to God through the Son, and in the power of the Holy Spirit, we meet and worship, and let it, may the Lord bless us as we gather. Uh, just a note that after our opening prayer, we'll have a hymn sing this afternoon, so if you have a psalter or a hymn selection. Uh, and then, uh, just to note, this week we'll take a break from our midweek prayer meeting, but please, uh, we'll take that up again November 6th for your planning and your calendar. November 6th at 7 p.m. will be our next prayer meeting. Well, let's take a few minutes, in a few moments rather, in silent prayer, and uh, as we prepare our hearts to come before our God and seek Him in worship. Church of the living God, of the Lord Jesus Christ, as you're able, please stand. We hear God call us to worship, stirring us to worship Him, opening the way for us through Christ as we hear these words from Psalm 5 again. But let all those who rejoice, let all those rejoice rather who put their trust in you. Let them ever shout for joy because you defend them. Let those also who love your name be joyful in you. For you, O Lord, will bless the righteous. With favor, you will surround him as with a shield. Let's seek our God this afternoon. O Lord, our God, we take these promises to ourselves. We, uh, Lord, receive your word in faith. We do so, Lord, uh, thankful that you are a defender of the righteous and one who guards and cares for your people. And we are righteous because of the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ that has been 
a, a deposited into our, for, into our account that has been applied to us, by which we have been rescued from evil, from being your enemies, and we have been made your friends. We've been made your children. We have been brought into sweet communion, Lord, with you. And we thank you that we can then in this time of worship gather near to you again, gather close, uh, gather, Lord, and praise you. We, uh, we thank you that we can hear your word, that you would speak to us, Lord, that morning and evening you would speak your words into our ears and into our hearts, that we have, can have such uh, a blessed uh, gift from you. We thank you, Lord, for this whole hour, this time together. Refresh our souls, strengthen us, wherever, however we've come in this afternoon, wherever our hearts are, however we are feeling. We pray that you would minister to our need, care for us, and may we, above all in all these things, seek your glory as we worship you. In Jesus' awesome name we pray, amen. Please be seated. Selections from the Psalter or the hymnal. Oh, we got lots going on here. Luke. One hundred and one in the hymnal or the Psalter? One hundred and one in the hymnal. Psalter 130, 
600 in the hymnal. 600, this will be our last one. 600 in the hymnal. Let's now confess our faith together using the Westminster Shorter Catechism in the back of the hymnal, page 875. Question uh, and answer, questions and answers, uh, 84 and 85. We used these a couple weeks ago. We'll use them again tonight. This time we'll be in question 85. <coughs> But we'll do both 84 and 85 together. So eight, page 875, starting with question and answer 84. Brother, uh, brothers and sisters in Christ, what doth every sin deserve? Every sin deserves God's wrath and curse, both in this life and that which is to come. 
What doth God require of us that we may escape his wrath and curse due to us for sin? To escape the wrath and curse of God due to us for sin, God requireth of us faith in Jesus Christ, repentance unto life, with the diligent use of all the outward means, whereby Christ communicated to us the benefits of redemption. Amen. Let's take up our mission offering. Uh, for the final time this month, which will be, again, for the Canadian Church Development Trust and our church planting work in, uh, in our nation. Come to our prayer time, uh, just to mention a couple things. Um, Alina travels this week to back to Ukraine for some time and into Europe, so she leaves on Wednesday, so we'll be praying for Alina and praying for the Lord's blessing on her and care for her and uh, bringing and praying that He would bring her back uh, so we can enjoy her fellowship again in Christ. Um, the, uh, I think I sent some update about Randy and Allison. We can pray for Bill and Janet. Uh, as well, um, who are with them, but are returning back, I think it's this week. Um, and the, uh, our, our uh, other missionaries to Malawi, our other missionaries, the ones in Malawi, Tom and Sandra Van and they plan to head back next Monday, so we can be praying for their, for their return to Malawi. I think it'll be a short stint this time, probably coming back in May, but, um, but we can pray for them as they go and, um, and serve the Lord there in Malawi. Um, thank you for your love and care for our family. And uh, Lisa's health has uh, improved quite a bit. We travel this week together, uh, going to a conference together. So please appreciate your prayers for a blessing on that, for that to be a refreshing time for us both, and uh, and for Lisa to continue to uh, to grow in strength. So, um, but we uh, we will pray for that as well. Um, I think those are the items that I have. Of course, we give thanks for the birth of John, and uh, for the Lord's blessing on our families. So let's come before our God then and seek Him in prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It has been our privilege, O Lord our God, to learn from the lips of Jesus and by the power of the Holy Spirit how to pray. And first of all, Lord, we seek you. We seek your glory. We seek your purpose. We seek that you would accomplish all that you intend in our lives that would, in a manner that would maximize your honor and accomplish your kingdom purposes, that both working in us as recipients of your work, but also through us as those who are enabled both to will and to do your good pleasure, to do what you would have us to do, to serve where you have us to serve, even in our prayer time tonight, but even in our worship, in our day-to-day activities, our tasks, our, our responsibilities our, in, within our families, uh, Lord, as families. We pray that you would make us willing servants always, all the day. You have, Lord, also taught us through your Son that you delight to hear our prayers and help us as your children. And you have not only taught us this because he has said these words to us and taught us how to pray, but you have shown it through the sending of your Son, 
You have shown, Lord, that your words of care and compassion are not empty nor spoken in vain. You always mean what you say, and never once have you left your promises undone. At times, Lord, your promises have been long in being fulfilled. At times, O Lord God, what appears to us to be a failure, we know and we must believe in the end will turn to be the triumph, the victory that we have in Christ, and the great blessing that you intended by it. Just as Christ was long in coming, according to our standards, but exactly on time according to yours, so we, as we pray, we also pray that even as we raise petitions to you, that our petitions will be according to your will, and that those that are according to your will, which carry the promise of being answered and fulfilled, we would also be patient in waiting upon you, knowing your time is good. Lord, with confidence then, we call, uh, we, we, uh, and, and uh, since we've been called by you to pray, and we, uh, we come and we pray, O Lord, according to your mercy, open your ears to the prayers of your humble servants, even that we may obtain our petitions. Lord, make us ask those things which please you and that are honorable, all through Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom you work and by whom you answer our prayers. Lord, we bless you for your care in our families, for light when we deserve only darkness, for blessing when we deserve only your curse on account of sin, for life when we have earned death. We bless you and thank you, Lord, for the care that you show, and we pray that you would continue to enlighten our lives, continue to bless us, O God, continue to give us life. As your people, we pray, remind us of our blessings that you've provided for us day by day, and that, that, that this would produce in our hearts thankfulness as we ponder your ways, that we would bless you and praise you. Lord, with uh, the Collison family, we bless you for the safe uh, arrival of little John. We pray, Lord, with thanksgiving for another covenant son. Uh, we Thank you, Lord, for, uh, for the strength you've given to Lindsay and to this little guy. Uh, we pray that you would strengthen them, give them both what they stand in need of physically, and provide for, uh, for Mike and Lindsay spiritually, uh, that they would bless their children, raise them up in the fear of the Lord, particularly to be with Mike as the head of his home, and who carries that responsibility of teaching, of instruction, of a godly example as he carries that responsibility in a particular way. We pray, Lord, for a blessing on, on all their children, and that all of them would come to confess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. We are excited. Look forward to another opportunity to, be, to see a covenant child receive the covenant sign of baptism, and our, for ourselves to be reminded of our own baptisms, and to be both encouraged in your promises to us, to be uh, furthered in our resolve to live for you, who have, we who have been, who have the name of the Almighty God upon us. And Lord, if we've been baptized but have not professed faith in Christ, that we would be convicted in our souls of a need to own that baptism, to confess Jesus and not to deny Him who has set us apart for Himself. Lord, we pray uh, that you would grant us all grace in our covenant families to love and serve you, Lord, of whatever uh, size or shape our family is, that we would serve you, bless you, give you thanks. Uh, Lord, we pray that our hope would be in you. We thank you, Lord, for the other uh, children that are on the way, and we pray for Caitlin and Lyndon and Becky, and we pray for their children. We pray for strength, and we pray that in due time they would all, these children would also be born well and in a manner that honors you. We do pray, Lord, for... Uh, for our sister Linda, we thank you for her. We thank you that over the past month, since the passing away of Kloss, that you have strengthened her. You have sustained her. You have enabled her to work through all the busyness that came right around that time of his passing, but also that all the, the, much of the paperwork that comes with it, Lord, and a busy lots to do. And she has her own weakness. But Lord, we thank you that you've given her strength. We thank you that you are sustaining her. We thank you for continuing to be with her and care for her. We pray that we would be uh, generous with our care for her, our time and our prayers, that we would be remembering her and, uh, and seeking in different ways to be a blessing to her. We pray, Lord, that we as a church would be uh, faithful in caring for one another from the very beginning of life to the very end of life and everywhere in between, that we would be those who, uh, who cherish the children and the seniors and the families and the singles and every other, uh, every other 
person who's here, that we would care for one another and not forget, not so quickly forget one another. It can be so very easy, Lord, to be caught up in our own lives. It can be so very easy even just to be caught up with families that are like our own. Uh, Lord, whether it's families with children, always spending time with families with children, or whatever it might be, Lord, we need to be seeking out one another, caring for one another in Christ. And so where we need to grow in that, grow us, we pray. And pull us together as a church, that we would, uh, Lord, be united in Christ, and that that unity would far surpass any other category that we might find ourselves in, or might even want to place others in. Lord, we uh, pray for our, uh, our sister Alina. We thank you, Lord, that for the past few years we have had the privilege, the blessing of um, knowing her, of having her in our worship, of ministering to this sister in Christ and to her uh, and, and to uh, Tanya and, and uh, Oksana as well. We thank you for that. We bless you for them. We pray for Alina in particular as she travels back to Ukraine, as she'll be re reunited with her sisters and her family as she will see friends, and Lord, as she spends the next, uh, next nine months there and in other parts of Europe, we pray that you'd provide for her, grow her in Christ, bless this experience, grant her what she needs for her daily, uh, day by day, provide her daily bread and her daily spiritual care. We pray that, uh, Lord, uh, as her heart desire is to be here in Canada again, we pray that you'd return her to us and establish her way and lead her where you'd have her to go and how you'd have her to serve. Lord, we pray that you would bless her travels this week and keep her safe. We thank you, Lord, for the health you've given to Lisa. We uh, bless you for the love and the care of this church family. Uh, uh, Lord, in various ways, especially the prayers that have gone up on our behalf. And we pray with thanksgiving for that. We pray that you would bless the study leave uh, that, uh, that I have this week. And as we attend a conference and seek to be both spiritually refreshed and encouraged in the callings of, in our lives, that you would bless that time, bless our travels, bless... Uh, all, all the details of that. Uh, we pray that, uh, that you would bless uh, Don Codling and his ministry that he's preparing as he prepares to preach. We pray that he would preach the gospel fully and faithfully next week and uh, lead us well in the Lord's Supper. Uh, we thank you that he has regained enough strength to return to the pulpit, and so we pray that you would sustain and strengthen him as he hasn't preached here in some time. But we look forward to receiving his ministry. We do pray, Lord, that you'd prepare our hearts to receive the Lord's Supper to come, Lord, hungry, to feed upon Christ by faith, to receive, uh, Lord, your condescending grace as we, uh, as, as we uh, receive Christ, uh, Lord, in the symbols of the, uh, of the wine and the bread. We pray, uh, Lord, of thanksgiving for the visitors that have come through our doors. Again, we pray and bless you that you'd, uh, for that, for many new faces. It seems like every week there's somebody here who has never been here before, and we pray that we would be uh, quick to receive them, to welcome them, to show them love in Christ. Some leave quickly, and we don't have that opportunity. We pray they would return again and that we'd be able to get to know them. We pray that you would bring many, bring, uh, Lord, many, and save the lost in our community. Encourage, Lord, us in our reaching out, ministering to friends and family, and encouraging them, Lord, in, 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 uh, with genuine love to come and to worship the Lord, come and to hear the Word, come and repent and believe. We thank you for our presbytery. We thank you for our retired ministers, for Jerry Hamstra uh, and uh, Lord and Rick Barnes. We pray uh, for them, their particular places, uh, Jerry in Ontario and his ministry opportunities that he still has, and Rick here in Nova Scotia. Bless him up in Cape Breton. Bless him at the Gospel Light Church where he, now he, he continues to serve. And as they seek a minister, Lord, we pray that you'd provide a man of your choosing for that place, but we pray that you would bless Rick as he serves them until that time. We pray for strength for him and his wife and their aging and their health needs and also for the salvation of his children who are not walking with Christ. Lord, we thank you for our missionaries. We pray for the Manans as they plan to go back to Malawi. We thank you for Randy and Allison, uh, Lord, in Asia. We thank you for Bill and Janet. We turn them safely from there uh, this week. We pray that you would bless the labors of our missionaries as we send them out, as we give our tithes and our offerings for their service and for all the work of your church, Lord. May you bless them. May they be used well, used wisely. But Lord, multiply their, their work and may it have a great effect for the building up of Christ's church in these faraway places. We pray that our hearts would be with them and our prayers going with them. 
Lord, we think of all these things in the church. And then as we look around the world, our province, our nation, and the world around us, or there are many world events, many things that threaten our peace, perhaps, our spiritual peace. Uh, Lord, our hearts may be troubled. We pray, let not our hearts be troubled. We pray, Lord, that uh, things are far afield or nearer to home, that we would be trusting in you, relying on you, that our prayers would be filled with faith. We pray even with David, and we pray with Christ, as this as Psalm 16 points to him as well. Preserve us, O God, for in you we put our trust. We have set you, O Lord, always before us. Because you are at our right hand, we shall not be moved. With this faith, with this hope, we lay our petitions before you. We pray, Lord, that you would then also continue to teach us and encourage us in your word and by every means you give to strengthen our souls, even now from your word as it is read and then as it is preached, as we, as we hear it, may we receive it well. Strengthen me as your preacher, as your ambassador to be a faithful one. May we all receive your word, your message with faith and repentance. And so we commit all of this to you, confidence and hope to you, Father, through Christ our Lord, in whose name we pray, amen. Well, let's turn to the Word of God in these next moments, but let's sing. Let's sing first before we open the Bible. Hymn 489, Lord, like the publican I stand, hymn 489. be seated. Open God's Word to Acts 20. Acts 20, we'll read the exhortation of Paul, the apostle, to the elders of Ephesus. Verses 17 to 38. We're just going, though, to consider uh, the first few verses of this exhortation. We're going to read the whole thing, but consider the first few verses. Acts 20, beginning at verse 17. From Miletus, Paul sent to Ephesus and called for the elders of the church. And when they had come to him, he said to them, You know... From the first day that I came to Asia, in what manner I always lived among you, serving the Lord with all humility, with many tears and trials which happened to me by the plotting of the Jews, how I kept back nothing that was helpful, but proclaimed it to you and taught you publicly and from house to house, 
testifying to Jews and also to Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And see, now I go bound in the Spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that chains and tribulations await me. But none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself, so that I may finish my race with joy and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. And indeed, now I know that you all, among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God, will see my face no more. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men. For I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves, men will rise up, speaking perverse things, to draw away the disciples after themselves. Therefore, watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. So now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I have coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. Yes, you yourselves know that these hands have provided for my necessities and for those who are with me. I've shown you in every way by laboring like this that you must support the weak. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And when he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all. Then they all wept freely and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him, sorrowing most of all for the words which he spoke, that they would see, him, see his face no more. And they accompanied him to the ship. Well, congregation, imagine you went to your doctor. Maybe you don't have to imagine this too hard, but you went to your doctor looking for help. You went and you had severe stomach pain, but the doctor wanted to talk to you about how light bulbs are made, or perhaps was going through an office renovation and really wanted to know what your opinion was on a wall color and whether the, the drapes would match and was talking to you about everything and anything except the problem that you so very much need to be solved. Or perhaps even worse, you go to the doctor and you've got a sprained ankle and the doctor says, you know what? Go dancing. That'll help. You just go dancing. Go, go jump around a bit. Maybe go run around. Run around the building for a few times. That will solve everything. Or if you've got a migraine, crank up the music. Find some music as loud as you can and see what that does. They're telling you something that isn't going to help you. It's actually actively going to harm you. It's going to make the situation, the problem you have, worse rather than doing anything in a positive direction. I give this maybe silly, trite illustration as a, as a way of making us think a bit of how so many churches deal with sinners who are guilty with sin and are cursed by God, who are under His wrath and His curse, and they go to churches that will not deal with their guilt, will not, will not talk to them about their sin will tell them cute stories that are meant to warm the heart. We'll talk about politics and climate change and every other thing under the sun except the need for repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ alone as the only way to deal with the very real sin problem and guilt that grips the soul. Or even perhaps worse... Instead of just avoiding it altogether, they actually point them in a direction of moralism. They tell you that you're actually a good person after all, and you're naturally good, you're born good, and, and that your issues really aren't internal too much. All you need to do is work a little harder, be a little nicer, be a better neighbor, love, without defining it, try harder and you'll feel better, and that sin itself God isn't angry with your sin. Sin is against your fellow man. You've offended somebody. You've been mean to your brother or whatever, but, but that God's fine. So try a little harder to be a better person. Jesus Christ 
is perhaps a good example of sacrifice, but he's not there to help you. He can't take away your guilt. He certainly is not an atoning sacrifice for your sin and to remove your guilt. He's no help there. He's just an example, someone to look up to, someone to, uh, to, to a model for you to follow on your own. And what this does is instead of, of course, dealing with any of the real guilt and sin problem that you have, it burdens you with doing all these other things that aren't actually going to give you hope and aren't going to help. It's going to make it far worse because now you're, you're being driven by yourself to do something. You're being told to do something that's actively harming you, that's actually building up further wrath of God against you, for it's all you trying your hardest. There's no answer given in such, by such teaching. There's no escape provided from the wrath and curse of God. You are pointed in the wrong direction. Instead of being pointed to the cross, you're being pointed away from the cross to run in another direction. God forbid that ever be the preaching that comes in this pulpit, in this place, within our congregation. Because that is a preaching that damns souls, does not save souls that increases the wrath and curse of God against you and does not resolve the wrath and curse of God against you. And last time when we were considering uh, the, uh, the, the, the teaching in Shorter Catechism 84, what does every sin deserve? Or every sin, one sin, if you only had one sin in your life, you deserve the wrath and curse of God both in this life and forever that which is to come. Your whole eternity is condemnation. It's an awful reality that ought to make you and me, even as believers in Christ, hate sin, flee from sin, not want to get near to sin, not try to draw that fine line thinking, well, I'm not in sin unless I, oh, I'm half in, or just to get away from it altogether, to get as far from this by the means God has given as we possibly can. But we also heard of that wonderful call that God gives, calling us to Himself through Jesus Christ, that there is a way to escape the wrath and curse of God. Remember, we were in Revelation 22, and, and right there, even at the very end of the Scriptures, even as God is talking about the very end of the world, where after that point, nothing will be changed, where not a single, uh, where, where all will be in eternity and in their eternal destiny and will not be, be able to be saved from it. There's still a call to those who are yet in this life. Come, drink of the waters of life freely. And that's what Paul is going to proclaim and has, is in, in, an, in uh, reviewing his own ministry, declares what he has proclaimed to the people that he has ministered to. This was his message, and Paul is telling the church, proclaim this, in order to escape the wrath and curse of God, you must repent of your sin and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the message we need to hear this afternoon. That's the message that always needs to be preached and proclaimed by the faithful churches of Christ. When Christ's church is faithful, she proclaims faith and repentance as the only hope to escape God's just wrath and curse. When Christ's church is faithful, she proclaims faith and repentance as the only hope to escape God's just wrath and curse. And we're going to see this just in verses 18 to 21 of our text, where we have first, we're going to look at our catechism question in a sense uh, a little bit backwards, because uh, we're going to first talk about the proclamation of hope, the means by which God ministers hope and gives us uh, to, uh, to receive the message, the ordinary means that God uses, and then we're going to talk about repentance and faith and what that looks like and what Paul's talking about here. And this, of course, is the question that we're considering is really a, a summary, Shorter Catechism 85, is really a, a bigger, a, a summary of, of a lot more that's going to get unpacked in the coming weeks as we're going to talk about repentance, talk about faith, talk about uh, the ordinary means of grace by which God reaches out to us with the gospel and works in our hearts. So first we're going to see in verses 18 to 20, proclaiming hope, and then in verse 21, we're going to hear Paul's testifying to repentance and faith and the call for us as the church to do this. Well, Paul was on his way to Jerusalem. Paul was traveling as fast as he could to get to Jerusalem. He wanted to be there to be able to proclaim and testify to faith and repentance in Jesus Christ. 
And so Paul, uh, when he gets to Miletus on the coast, he calls the elders, ruling elders, ministers, those who are ordained, calling them from uh, Ephesus, which is about a two-day journey, to come and meet with him uh, at Miletus so he could address them and speak to them. Now, this was uh, Ephesus was located in what the text here says, Asia. That's important for us to understand. This is not talk, he's not talking about the continent of Asia as we have it today. Asia was a Roman province, and it inclu- which included an area that is mostly in modern-day Turkey uh, today. And so that's where Ephesus, that's where we'd find Ephesus. If you wanted to go see Ephesus, the ruins of Ephesus, you'd go to Turkey. Uh, but this was, this, was, this was the province of Asia, not the giant continent um, that, uh, that, that, out that way. But Paul then is in Miletus. He sends for the elders, and the elders come to meet with Paul. And he begins to unpack for them the apostolic approach to ministry. And of course, the apostles were given as a temporary office given uh, by Christ to establish the church and to establish the ongoing regular ministry of elders and ministers that was to then carry on the work of the apostles except without the signs and the wonders and, uh, and, and without the inspired ministry, but they would have the Word of God. And so the, apost- the, the approach of Paul... Paul's uh, speaking of how he conducted himself as an apostle was not just for them to agree that they had seen this, they had seen it, they had witnessed this, they had been ministered to by him, but they were also going to learn from him that they were to emulate, they were to uh, see him as an example to follow. He was teaching them how they themselves must continue the ministry that he had begun long after he was off the scene. And they knew Paul. These would have been men who knew Paul, who loved Paul, who had been perhaps even converted under the ministry of Paul, for Paul had spent, as he will say, three years in Ephesus, three years in that city, preaching faith and repentance to those, to all, to Jews, to Greeks, to all, publicly and privately. And Paul testifies to his ministry. He says, you know, and he knew they knew, they couldn't argue with him here, you know that from the first day that I came to Asia, to the Asian province, in what manner I always lived among you, serving the Lord with all humility, with many tears and trials, three ways that we're going to unpack. How I kept back nothing that was helpful. Paul here is is explaining. He's saying this is pretty comprehensive. Always I conducted my ministry in this way. Always I was faithful to the Lord who called me for three years. And they weren't just three easy years. You go back to Acts 19, and there's Demetrius and the, 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 the riot in Ephesus, because so effective was the, the work of the Spirit in that city that, that, the, that those who are making uh, little, little trinkets and, and knickknacks to sell in honor of their, their, their pagan gods were threatened. Their business was threatened, and it caused a riot. And Paul was at different points, as he was in other places, would have been torn to pieces if they had, he wanted to enter in to where the riot was, and they wouldn't let him. This was a difficult ministry, but Paul was sold out for Christ. He was a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. Did I serve the Lord? He was a slave, a bondservant of Christ, giving his whole life for his service. Now, Paul was not bragging here. Paul was not promoting himself. Paul was not interested in having a whole bunch of people follow him for his sake, but he was simply laying out the truth of the ministry that God had enabled him to have, the faithfulness that God had given him so that they themselves would desire and seek from the same God the same faithfulness that he had. This is a message as well. As Paul boldly declares that uh, that, as he will say later, that, that he is, he is uh, innocent of the blood of all men, so faithful was the ministry. This is a calling on us as well as the church. Certainly, it's a calling and, and, and uh, a desire that we as elders ought to have to be able to proclaim and declare this with such boldness and conviction that, I have, that I have, oh, we have always conducted ourselves in this godly manner. But it's for you and me as Christians as well to consider our lives and to say, could we be as bold about our faithfulness to our Lord Jesus Christ? Are we this committed to Jesus? Are we, have we been this faithful to Him? Or are there parts of our lives we've kind of, we would have to shave off in order to be able to say this, or whole chunks of our life? Paul here 
is calling them to serve, as he will say to the Corinthians, serve me, imitate me as I imitate Christ. And that is how we ought to be able to speak as Christians to others. Imitate me as I imitate Christ, for there ought to be no daylight between our imitation of Christ and of, of the faithfulness that Christ himself lived. And I, I realize we're, we're sinners. Paul's a sinner. He's not perfect. He's living in faith and repentance every day. But still, he could boldly declare these things and give the glory to the Lord. And Paul, in specific, specifically, when he says he's serving the Lord, he gives three ways that he gave himself in service to the Lord. With, first, he says, I served with all humility. He was a humble servant. He was like Jesus Christ, who came not to be served, but to serve and to give himself for those who were lost, that they might come to have an interest in Jesus Christ. He had their interests at heart. He wasn't seeking to promote himself. He wasn't looking to get another book deal and hoping to get another book into the, into the inspired canon because he's Paul, and it's Paul, you know, you know, people that have their names, you know, so-and-so ministry. You know, he's, he's Paul the Apostle Ministries, you know, and he's looking for a big crowd. No, he's, he's serving with their interests at heart. He was serving Jews and Greeks, those who loved him, those who hated him, those who loved Christ, those who hated Christ, and he was seeking for them to know the only hope, the only way to escape the wrath and curse of God that all were under. He served with humility. I think I've said this before, but that word for humility in Greek literature, in Greek pagan literature, was an insult. It was a weakness. It was not a compliment to be told to be that you were humble. But for the Christian, it's a core value. It's a core characteristic of the Christian life, as Paul would write to, uh, to another church, to the, to the Colossian church. He said, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, and he goes on how we to live with one another in this manner. It's a Christian virtue. That's how Paul served. He said, I served with humility. He was serving others, not himself. But he also served with heart. He served with heart. He gave his mind for the preaching and proclamation of the gospel and his heart for their service because he served, he served with tears. He served with many tears. He, he was a man who suffered. He was a man who suffered greatly. He said, I suffered under the Jews. The word for plotting is used four times. It's all in the book of Acts. They're all the Jews, and they're always against Paul. They were, they were always plotting his demise. Somehow, somewhere, he had people that wanted him dead. He wanted pe people wanted him to be quiet. People wanted to make him quiet. His tears were not for himself. His tears were not... Uh, out of sadness for his own life or his own suffering. His tears were the heart that he had for the church of the Lord Jesus Christ to be and remain faithful. His tears were for his own countrymen, his fellow Jews, whom he longed for uh, them to, to serve Christ, to come to know their Messiah instead of reject him. He gave his heart to the ministry. The third way Paul served is he persevered. He persevered. He served with perseverance. He says there in verse 20, he says, You know how I kept back nothing that was helpful, but proclaimed it to you and taught you publicly and from house to house. He kept back. He did not, uh, he, he did not hold back what they needed to hear. He did not, you know, he, 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 he probably he, he would have, could have been tempted to think, and we might be tempted to think, well, if you just were a little quieter about it. Right? You just, just stayed in the church. Don't go, out in the, don't go out anywhere else. If you just, if you just talk to fellow believers, if you just, just were a little quieter, Paul, things wouldn't be so difficult. You wouldn't have so many troubles. You, the Jews might you know, be calm and be okay with things. But in spite of the threats, he persevered. He pressed on. He didn't hold back the gospel proclamation. He didn't change the message to try to appeal to more people. He didn't try to use man's wisdom to appeal to men. He simply preached the gospel with Holy Spirit-given, prayer-gained courage. He was able to do this with boldness, not of himself, but God had equipped him for this, was preparing for him for this. God will do this for us as the church. And he did this fully. He kept back nothing that was helpful. He wanted to, he didn't want to fill with fluff and with things that would point you in the wrong direction or talk about everything but the issues that you had, the needs you had. He wanted to be faithful, and he was faithful. And he was faithful publicly. 
in the public realms or in the synagogues as he preached the word, and he did so privately as he moved from house to house, from smaller group settings or families. He was faithful in every opportunity that he had, proclaiming hope, declaring the full gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And what Paul's ministry gives to us as the church is a model for our own ministry, a model for the approach we ought to have as the church of Jesus Christ. The message of Christ is not to be hidden in philosophy, in complicated, uh, in complicated words, in, in ways that only those who sit in an ivory tower, only ivory tower theologians are able to discuss and talk about or to be hidden in, in foreign languages like in the, in the pre-Reformation time when everything was in Latin and the common man didn't know, couldn't even read the Bible because they couldn't read Latin, couldn't understand what was said in the churches and it was all just meant to be just for a, a higher class clergy and, the, and the, lo, the local people. It was not for them. The, church of, the message of Christ calling us to faith and repentance is not just for complicated uh, philosophical debates and discussions. The church, the, the message of Jesus Christ is also not to be changed in order to appeal to men. We are never have the right to change the message God has given us. We do not get to change it or hide it or tweak it or try to be more, to, to try to, to be more appealing. And that the gospel, the message of Jesus Christ must not be held back by us under the guise of saying, well, God will save those whom He's elected. He's sovereign. He'll bring them in. And so we don't have much to do. We ought not to go out and make too much of a fuss. No, we ought to proclaim the gospel boldly and faithfully because God calls us to declare this gospel boldly and faithfully. He calls you and me to be faithful in our use of the outward means as a church for us to proclaim the gospel in the ways that Christ has ordained. The ways that God has ordained are, are, uh, and that Christ has given are the ordinary ways by which God Himself will intends to work, the ordinary ways by which He brings the gospel to bear on people's lives through, as we're going to see in a few weeks, the, the preaching, the reading, and especially the preaching of God's Word through prayer and through the sacraments. This is not man-made ideas of how we're going to have, have the best strategy for getting the gospel. These are God-given, Christ-ordained ways of His ordinary working in, in our lives and in the lives of any unbeliever. And if it's God's way, if this is God's way, this bold, unashamed proclamation of the gospel, then we as a church collectively are responsible to proclaim this gospel, to use those means, not to hold them back. And you and I individually are responsible to receive the ministry of God through the ordinary ways that He, has, that he provides it through coming and being under the Word and engaging in prayer and receiving the sacraments in faith. Paul and his ministry, Paul's, Paul's ministry was well-rounded. It was zealous and bold. It was compassionate and caring. It was full of truth and full of heart. Paul ministered faithfully. He cared for the people he ministered to. And, and his a model for um, of ministry to follow, and you all know, most of you know this that, and, and have experienced this, as I've come in my first visits in your homes, I've read this passage because for me this, is, this has shaped the philosophy of my own ministry, of how I'm to minister not only publicly in the pulpit, but also from house to house, home to home, in your homes, caring for you. And that's, that, that is not just my, that's just not for me, it's for all the elders, the session together in our ministry to you. Pray for me. Pray for your elders. Pray that I, that I and we together would be faithful in doing this, faithful to proclaim the hope of the gospel as God calls us to do, that, that we would imitate Paul as he imitates Christ. This was not Paul's invention, but he did what Christ did, who also boldly, faithfully proclaimed the gospel publicly and privately. And for you, as you receive this ministry, you, you support the public ministry of the gospel by your attendance, by your receiving the Word, by your engagement in public worship, by your responding to the Word. You receive the private visitation and care and love of the elders, and you love and pray for the proclamation of the gospel to the world, to the ends of the earth, both what we do as a church, what we do as a presbytery, what we do, what the church of Christ does more broadly. We proclaim hope. 
When Christ's church is faithful, she proclaims hope. She proclaims faith and repentance as the only hope to escape God's just wrath and curse. Well, the focus then to begin has been, as I said, that second part of our Shorter Catechism question and the first part of our text, which is proclaiming hope, the focus on the way of proclaiming. But what is it then that's to be proclaimed? Well, here we testify to repentance and faith, testifying to repentance and faith. In verse 21, Paul says, as he describes his work, he said, I kept back nothing. I proclaimed it publicly and from house to house, testifying to Jew and Jews and also to Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul didn't hold back the full gospel. Paul didn't hold back uh, the, the truth, and half of it or part of it, he proclaimed it fully. He didn't hold back. These are the two key parts of the, of the message of salvation, repentance and faith. And we find this in Scripture alternating. We'll talk about this in a moment. Sometimes it's repentance and faith. Sometimes it's faith and repentance. But they, they go together. These are two key parts of the proclamation of the gospel. Repentance is a, a, when you repent of something, you turn away from it towards something else. You turn away. You recognize I'm going in the wrong direction. You, you, you realize you're going down the road in the wrong way and you turn around. You've repented. It doesn't mean you've sinned. It just means you've repented. You've turned back. You've realized I'm going in the wrong direction. And of course, for our, own, for our, our lives before the Lord, repentance is when we, are, we recognize we have been walking against God, sinning against Him. We have been used, wasting our lives in, in, in fighting against God and running in the direction of evil, and we need to turn back. We need to turn away from that sin and turn to God in Jesus Christ. This is when the Holy Spirit works in your heart, opens your eyes, shows you your sin, and makes you aware of the danger you're in, that if you do not know Jesus Christ, you will be lost forever. You are under God's wrath and curse. And you turn around by the power of God according to the terms of God. This is not a negotiation. Lord, I'll come back to you if you do this for me and if I'm allowed to hold on to these sins over here. No, it is a full turning back to God, forsaking our sin, endeavoring after new obedience in and through Jesus Christ. This is the message, of course, that Christ proclaimed, as we, uh, as we hear in Luke chapter 5, where Jesus says these well-known words, as the, the Pharisees, who didn't think they needed to repent of anything, were grumbling about Jesus spending time with tax collectors and sinners. And Jesus said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, the self-righteous, but sinners to repentance. This is a message to be proclaimed by the church to all. You are a sinner. You need to turn away from your sin to the only hope there is in Jesus Christ. Testifying to Jews and also to Greeks, repentance toward God. And in this context, because we also see another person of the Trinity mentioned in this context, God here is a reference to God the Father. It's the Father who's represented, uh, who represents the whole Trinity in terms of being offended by the sin of men. And it's Christ then, it's the in, in the Father repentance, uh, but it's the in the faith, uh, faith in Christ that we need to have. It's in Christ faith that we ought to have that goes together. For it's Christ who's been sent as the second person of the Trinity to be the mediator, to come between an offended God and a sinful man, to come and stand in the gap between us so that there can be some connection again between God and us. There can be a way of escaping the just wrath and curse of God. It's Jesus who came into this world who obeyed God perfectly, did not offend Him in a single moment or with a single sin, and who died to deal with the offense against God. He is the one who provided a, a, a way so that your repentance could actually be, that there was something to turn to, even as you wanted, turned away from sin. And this is a call that you are to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. It's who you turn to God through Jesus Christ. And to believe in Jesus Christ means you need to know your need of Him. You need to 
understand who he is and how God has sent him and that he, how, he, how it is that he can save you from your sins and remove God's wrath and curse. And then knowing these things, it's to cast yourself upon him with no hope in yourself, but all hope in him that he can save you. He can sustain you. He can hold you up. It's not just to tenderly say, I don't know if I'm going to, maybe I'll hold on to one of his fingers and see if that goes first. No, it's to completely cast yourself on Jesus. That is to lay hold of him by faith. That's what it means. Faith is the means by which we lay hold of Christ. He's the God-given Savior. Yes, the offended God has given a Savior, has provided a way for sinners to be reconciled to Himself. And you either believe on Jesus Christ and, and receive that salvation, or you reject Him, believe in yourself, believe in something else, and face the eternal wrath and curse of God. Now, we're going to consider faith and repentance in the coming weeks in more detail. But this afternoon, they are brought together for us. And this afternoon, we need to recognize that these two go together. These go together. You cannot have faith without repentance. You cannot have repentance without faith. They go together. There's no hope. If, if, you, have, uh, if you have repentance or you think to have repentance without faith, well, you have no place of hope to turn to. You have no way to deal with your sin and your guilt. You have no way to go except in another direction other than to God because there's no, the way to God is blocked without faith. There's no way to go. What you'll end up doing is, again, continually trying yourself harder and harder and harder to find a way to deal with your sin, to make amends, to try something, which will only make your sin and your guilt worse and worse and worse. You're not going in a better direction. You're just going in maybe in a, in a slightly different direction instead of turning around and coming by faith to Christ. But of course, you can't have faith without repentance, because why do you need to believe in Jesus Christ if you have no need of Jesus Christ? Why is it that, uh, why, what, what, is, what, is, what will Jesus offer you if you're okay? There's nothing to repent of. No sins that you can think of. Yeah, and you're not that bad. You're a pretty decent person. You're pretty good. You like people. You're nice. You're... This is why salvation is so cheap in our world today. There's so many who want Jesus for some reason, but don't want to change their life, don't want their life to be different, any different than it is right now. And quite frankly, don't think it needs to be much different than it is right now. Now, logically, if you want to talk about faith and repentance, logically, faith comes first. Logically, you need to believe that you're a sinner and need in need of a Savior and that there is a Savior provided in Christ before you will want to turn, before you'll have that. That's the work of the Spirit in our effectual calling. We lay hold of Christ by faith. But in reality, faith and repentance is why they're, oh, they're, they're, they're held together in Scripture and can alternate. Sometimes it's faith and repentance. Sometimes faith and re repentance and faith in the discussion. But they're inseparable. They're two sides of the same coin. You can't believe without repentance, and you, uh, you can't repent if you don't believe. And faith and repentance then has become, in the Scriptures, shorthand for the gospel. This is what Jesus says in, in Mark chapter 1, very succinctly, as He summarizes His whole public ministry. As he comes and declares, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Mark 1, 15. And so what we must do as the church is make sure that we are preaching then this full gospel. Teaching repentance and faith. Faith and repentance. That sinners would come to know the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved from the wrath and curse of God. But not only for those who are not yet in Christ, but also that this would be, this is, this is also for the nurture of believers. This is for your nurture and growth in grace, that daily our life is a life of repentance and faith. Daily is a life of turning away from whatever remaining sins and corruptions there are and turning back to the Lord in faith, seeking forgiveness and seeking the growth and grace and a steadfastness in our belief. This message that Paul preached was not merely seeker-sensitive, as it were, to seek just the lost, and there was no food here for the, uh, the saved. It was also for the saved that their salvation would grow, that the work God had begun would be completed. And this was the message Paul said he testified to Jews and to Greeks, to testify to all of them because they all needed the same message. Whether it was the Jews who clung to their law and their law-keeping and all of these ideas, or the Greeks who had all these other pagan ideas and pagan philosophies and other mystery religions and all other things, Paul had one message. It was the same message. 
Repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And to testify, testify was a word that, that was like courtroom language. It was a solemn testimony, a solemn declaration. It was not loose and light and, and, and fluffy words that Paul used. This was solemn in the court. If you're going to testify in court, it, will, it needs to be solemn and soberly done. It has consequences. Your testimony may lock someone up for life or may set a murderer free. Or your, your testimony has, has effects. And what is more solemn than to say to somebody or to a, to, the, to a church or to people before you, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. If you don't believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you will face the wrath and curse of God forever and ever and ever, and there will be no change. This is why hearing about hell last time was, ought, to, ought to grip our heart and grab us and make us hate sin and cling to the Lord Jesus Christ for all we're worth. Did it make any impression on your heart? But the wrath and curse of God and how solemn and serious it is that we would be under that and how if we're saved, God has saved us. And if you're not, how desperately you need to repent and believe on the Lord Jesus. Paul's testimony was for all to hear and it would either be used to save them or to condemn them. Paul was earnest. Paul was faithful in declaring this message because he loved Jesus Christ and he loved all whom he saw. He wanted them to hear, know, and believe. This is why he says in verse 24, none of these things, talking about all these chains and tribulations, none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself so that I may finish my race with joy and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. And this is exactly what Paul said to Timothy in his last letter in the New Testament, in his near-to-death letter to Timothy. I charge you, I charge you, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at His appearing and His kingdom, preach the Word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. He didn't say, Timothy, go and preach this message because everybody's going to love you when you declare it, and they're all going to come back for more, and they're all going to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and none of them are going to want to stone you at all. No, he says you preach it in spite of the opposition. You preach it in spite of the way that it's going to rub people the wrong way and because it's going to hit their heart. You testify, Timothy, because this is the only testimony that matters for them. They can hear about this or that and learn of this thing that, that, that pleases their ears and leads them to hell. But you need to preach and proclaim faith and repentance in the Lord Jesus Christ and all that it contains. And that is our marching orders as the church. That is what we ought to do. How many churches compromise this message and, are, and, and lead sinners Either leave them lost or lead them to hell directly. We don't get to change the message that God has entrusted to us as the church. We don't get to declare a different message for the salvation of unbelievers or the nurture of God's people. There is far too much at stake for us to start tinkering with the gospel. The eternal destiny of men and women, boys and girls, is at stake. We must proclaim faithfully and fully the message that Christ has entrusted to us. And when Christ's church is faithful, she proclaims faith and repentance as the only hope to escape God's just wrath and curse. We've heard the diagnosis a couple weeks ago and again tonight. but We've also heard of the wonderful solution to the wrath and curse of God that is offered in Jesus Christ, a message you and I must believe, a message we must testify to. Will everyone who walks through the doors of this church hear both the the, the diagnosis of their problem and the answer, the solution, the resolution that is offered in Jesus Christ? When you come, do you come here seeking to hear this full gospel for your own daily living, your own day-to-day service for the Lord Jesus Christ? Whereby, yes, you come and you want to hear about heaven, but heaven cannot always be preached without hell. 
mercy of God cannot be preached without, this, without the justice of God also being a very re, the very reality that, also, uh, uh, that comes through in the ministry. If we are to commend Jesus Christ to any, they must know they are condemned without Him. If you're going to commend Christ, it must be to those who know they are condemned. Is that the message you want to hear? Is that the message you hope to hear and pray will always be preached in this pulpit? Pray. Pray it's the message. Pray for me. Pray for all who ever fill this pulpit and for other churches that you know and love and hold and have friends and family and that they would hear this message. When you hear the call to faith and repentance that May God make us that we would respond with humility, that we would repent, that we would seek increased faith as His people, that you and I would always respond in this way to God's gospel, that we would receive the full gospel, respond to the full gospel with faith and repentance, and receive the blessings that are given only through Jesus Christ, the blessings of escaping the wrath and curse of God and entering into that blessed relationship that He offers us. Let's pray. Lord, we thank You for the message of faith and repentance, repentance and faith. We thank You, Lord, that this is the message You call Your church to proclaim, for it's the message of hope. It's the message, it's, it's the message that, that addresses the very deep needs of the soul. It's the message, Lord, that encompasses all Your wonderful saving plans for mankind. And Lord, we must proclaim it. May we proclaim it faithfully. Lord, correct us if in any way we have gone astray. Forgive us, Lord, if in any way we have uh, 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 twisted the gospel or have tw- tinkered with the gospel. God, may the ministry of this pulpit, my ministry and the ministry of anyone who preaches here be faithful. May the ministry of the elders here of this session as we minister from house to house and in our public ways Lord, may it be faithful and true. Make us faithful and true. And may we as a people of God be thankful to receive such a ministry, be testifying in the ways you give us to those around us uh, of the call to Christ and testifying to these, these serious and solemn things. God in heaven, may we see not according to man's wisdom, but according to the divine wisdom of God. May we see many who are touched by this message, moved by your spirit, brought to turn from their sin to Jesus Christ, repenting, believing on him, and receiving eternal life, escaping the wrath and the curse of God forever. Lord God, may we be witnesses to that, and may it bring glory and honor to your name. May we, as a whole church community, and in our own lives, we be able to testify as Paul did, that we are innocent of the blood of all men, for we, in the opportunities you have given us, have proclaimed a faithful gospel. Make it so. Bring fruit to your glory. In Christ alone we pray. Amen. Please take your Psalter. We'll conclude singing Psalter 32. We'll start with 32a, and then after the benediction we'll sing 32b as our doxology. So 32a, let's stand to sing.
receive now the blessing of your God and go with his peace and by his strength. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and our God and Father, who has loved us and given us everlasting consolation and good hope by grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. Amen.